next Sydney CPPC seminar. Uh, today's speaker is Kare Frieder, who is at KK. He's a postdoc at KK since last November. Um, he obtained his PhD from the TU Munich um, la last year together uh, under supervision of Julia Hartz. And now he's a postdoc at KK and jointly with Florida State University. And he will be telling us about lepton flavor relation at Midristan and beyond. And he has here the two references he's mostly talking about. So please, Karen, take okay. it away. Thank you very much for the introduction. So yes, I will talk about uh, lepton flavor violation at Midristan. And the the beyond part is uh, I will motivate why we specifically look for lepton flavor violation uh, in this subservable also. So it's based mostly on these two references. So the first one was a paper that we recently uh, was recently accepted for publication in JHIP. And the second reference is uh, will come out very soon on the archive. So uh, to start, we know everybody knows that the standard model is uh, incomplete. And uh, there are maybe, there are three uh, uh, big open questions kind of to that the standard model fails to solve. One of them is the existence of dark matter, which we know from CMB observations and uh, and some more observables. We know that there is a baryon asymmetry, so an asymmetry, asymmetry between matter and antimatter. And we know that neutrinos are massive while in the standard model, they are massless. So, these are three things with which the standard model cannot explain. So there are different strategies we can use to try to solve this. We can tackle the different anomalies that appear. So the W mass anomaly, mu and G minus two and so on. Or we can uh, measure the Higgs. So after we discovered the Higgs, we uh, haven't really done so much more than that. So the one idea is to make sure that this is really is what the standard model thinks that the Higgs is. Or we can search for general beyond standard model uh, interactions, and uh, that could lead to some area of new of new physics that could solve one or several of these problems. So that's the strategy that I will talk about today. So um, also there seems to be a or there's a, a kind of consensus in the community that there. After the LHC has now done its job of finding the, the Higgs, there should be something new to look forward to, and there should be a next step kind of in uh, high energy physics. And a big question is then what kind of collider should the next collider be? So many people have been focusing on a linear electron positron collider, such as, such as the proposed ILC here in Japan. There has also been talk of an upgrade to the LHC by the to the FCC, so the uh, 100 kilometer proton proton collider and very and recently there's been more and more uh, talk about a muon collider so a completely new type of collider where you collide muons and, and each of these experiments has their benefits and drawbacks and what i will talk about today is the muon collider option and uh, one of the reasons that this is exciting is that it's been argued to be the cheapest of the three so but there are the the story is more complex than that but so I will mainly talk about muon colliders today. And specifically, I will talk about the proposed muon collider experiment that's been called New Tristan, which has been proposed here at KK. And uh, the idea of New Tristan is to use only uh, existing technologies. So this collider could be built without having to invent some new kind of magnet or new kind of cooling system. It can be built purely with things that exist uh, already today. And the idea is that you uh, accelerate protons here in the green part, collide them onto a target to produce a bunch of pions that uh, are collected here in the right figure. They are collected in a series of foils uh, to stop them where they then decay. And when they decay, they bind with the free electrons to form muonium. And this essentially uh, cools them down. So instead of having the pion, uh, muons flying away from the pion decay, you catch them by forming muonium. And then you, again, ionize the muonium with lasers to form a, a, a nice bunch of cold uh, muons. Uh, but you can only do this with mu plus because you have only free electrons. You don't have any free uh, positrons around here. So you can only catch the mu plus. So what this experiment then proposes to do is to have a beam with mu plus 
and collide that either collide that with electrons or collide with another U plus. So there, there are two modes in which this experiment can run, so to say. And how do you then look for beyond standard model physics here? So there are uh, one strategy is to look for effective interactions. So uh, because a muon collider is a very clean environment, it's uh, actually a lot better than, for example, the LHC at seeing these effective uh, interactions. And uh, so uh, new physics that gives uh, point-like interactions, and they could be, for example, seen in elastic scatterings like mu plus mu plus to mu plus mu plus. Uh, where the Lagrangian is then described by these um, four Fermi operators. And it has been shown uh, in a publication recently that uh, you could probe uh, order 100 TeV scales for these uh, coefficients uh, using only a 2 TeV center of mass energy. So that's uh, quite impressive. The second kind of strategy is to look directly for standard, uh, beyond standard model particles. So, for example, you could look for mu plus mu plus into two sleptons via a T-channel neutralino exchange. And in another publication recently, it's been shown that you could probe this, the neutralino masses up to uh, eight TV. And uh, depending on the, on the center of mass energy, you can also probe different masses of the sleptons. So this reach is also quite impressive. Um, so those are maybe two different uh, strategies. Uh, so we can then ask ourselves, is there a specific signal we could look for that would be directly connected to those big unsolved questions I mentioned in the beginning? One such signal is lepton number violation, which is a clear sign of new physics. There's no lepton number violation in the standard model. And it's directly related to two of those uh, open questions, namely the existence of neutrino masses and the baryon asymmetry. So the Neutrino, neutrinos could have a, what's called a Majorana mass, where their mass term violates lepton number. And uh, so this is uh, directly related then to, uh, yeah, searching for lepton number violation. The, there could all, there's also, it's also possible to generate a baryon asymmetry completely in the lepton sector, uh, and then convert that to the baryon sector via the Svalerons. To do that, you need, uh, uh, there are many different models that can do that, but you need always left number violation at some scale. And it's a bit related to dark matter too, in the sense that you could have right at a neutrino dark matter, or you could have um, dark matter uh, models where you scatter dark matter scatters with leptons to produce at the same time a dark matter, a sim a dark matter abundance and a lepton asymmetry. So is there then a way we could look for lepton number violation at mu tristan? Uh, so to do that, we can first study how how can we deal with lepton number violation uh, in the sense that it should be standard model invariant. Well, one language to do that is to use the SMEFD, so standard model effective field theory, where we take the standard model Lagrangian and extend it by a series of operators, uh, where lepton number violation only occurs at odd mass dimensions, so the mass dimension 5, 7, 9, 11, and so on. And here the, the C, the Wilson coefficient in front, has a mass dimension that balances out the operator to make the whole Lagrangian dimension 4. And at dimension 5, there's only a single operator, uh, so which looks like this, so two left and doublets and two Higgs doublets. And if you try to draw a diagram that gives this operator at three level, there's only three possibilities, and those are the three seesaw types. So there's not so much complexity in this operator in terms of UV models, at least at three level. Uh, the second simplest, uh, or the second lowest dimension at which you can find lepton number violation is dimension seven, where going just one step up in the dimension increases the complexity by quite a lot, giving you instead 12 operators uh, to look for. So the phenomenology uh, relating to these operators can be quite interesting as well. So uh, what, are then the, uh, what are then the existing constraints on these types of operators? So I think what most people are aware of, or what also gives the most stringent constraints is uh, neutrino-less double beta decay, where two neutrinos decay into two positrons at the same time uh, and emit two electrons, but no neutrinos. And uh, this is lepton violating because you have leptons in the final state, but none in the initial state. And both 
uh, operators at dimension five and seven can give rise, give rise to this kind of process. So in the left here, you see seven dimension operator giving all the left number violation in one of these vertices. And on the right here is a five dimensional mass insertion simply in the neutrino propagation between two standard model W bosons giving the same kind of uh, final state. And the currently most stringent limit on this decay is around 10 to the 26 years. So it's a very tight uh, limit. Uh, it's also possible to look for lepton number violation in rare K on the case. So uh, what I mean by that is K on to pi on and two neutrinos, which cannot occur at dimension five, but recurs dimension seven. So there we see the need to uh, also increase the dimension in the description of lepton number violation. Um, so there is actually a standard model mode here where there's a neutrino antineutrino in the final state, but in a left anomaly violating mode, you could have neutrino neutrino or antineutrino antineutrino. So in that sense, that would be left anomaly violating. And how to constrain this is then to look for deviations from the standard model expectation. So the branching ratio is uh, expected to be 10 to the minus 11 or so. And the current experimental constraints is uh, getting quite close to, or it's, they are observing some events already and they're getting closer to this uh, limit. You could also look for uh, left annihilation in neutrino experiments. So coherent elastic neutrino nuclear scattering, neutrino scattering of nuclei. Uh, you could see left annihilating contributions from dimension seven operators as deviations from the expected kind of distribution in events. Uh, so this is a very new probe being first observed. I mean, the standard model process was first observed in 2017. Uh, also for oscillation experiments, uh, where you produce neutrinos in one place and you catch them in another place, you could look for left lepton violation from both dimension seven and five operators. So either the left lepton violation occurs in the interaction where you catch the neutrino, and in that in that kind of way, it's a seven dimensional process because there are uh, multiple fermions involved. Uh, if on the other hand, the neutrino uh, has a Majorana mass insertion while it is propagating to the second side, that's a five dimensional process most likely. So this kind of search can look for both of them. And the last thing I will talk about here is the LHC. So in a quite recent analysis, it was argued that you could look for this five dimensional operator through W boson fusion. And the benefit of doing this is that you are now can now use the muon flavor uh, because you produce muons in the final state, while neutrinoless double beta decay only looks for the electron flavor because it uh, it has electrons in the final state simply. So only the electron flavor is involved, while here the muon flavor is also involved. So it gives actually a different kind of constraint. Um, then, as we will show in this uh, upcoming publication, it's also possible to then look for the, the seven-dimensional uh, processes at LHC in uh, different kind of processes. So, taking everything together, now the current uh, status of all of this uh, can be seen here. So, the red bars, which dominate for most of the operators, uh, are the constraints coming from the neutrino stable beta decay. And the, uh, the yellow bars here are for the LHC uh, searches. And uh, yeah, there, there are more things uh, here than I can talk about quickly. Um, but, but one noteworthy thing here is the, the flavor aspect of it. So if you look at the, the neutrino stable beta key limits, they're only in the electron flavor, like we said, and the LHC limits are in the muon flavor. So even though, Let's take, for example, this first operator Q L L H. Even though the neutrino double beta K has uh, constrained the scale to be uh, more over uh, two hundred TeV, while at the L H C it's been constrained to be over one TeV. This this is a different. They they are different in the sense that they have different flavor aspects. And if we remain agnostic, saying that we don't really understand what flavor is or where it comes from or what to expect. From any kind of left and ambulation, which flavor should be dominant, then we can see them as two different constraints. So with this in mind, how about muon colliders then? Because they are muons in the in the initial state even. So uh, can we use muon colliders to improve upon these constraints? 
So at Mitristan, we can then take these, this lepton annihilating Lagrangian, the five dimensional, seven dimensional so on operators, and look how they would appear at Mitristan. So at dimension five, this operator can lead to W plus W plus production. So two muons into two W pluses. And this is lepton annihilating because you have leptons in the initial state, but you don't have any leptons in the final state. However, this diagram is suppressed by the smallness of the neutrino mass because you have, I mean, so in the broken standard model, you have here two W bosons, but in the, the operator where it comes from, in the uh, in the full standard model invariant operator, you have mu mu, higgs higgs, <clears throat> and this would then give the neutrino a mass. You cannot avoid that. And we know that the neutrino mass is small. Therefore, we know already before even running the experiment, we know that this kind of diagram is very small. And at dimension seven, you can then look for processes at dimension seven. Uh, however, one drawback there, which is also a drawback for any other experiment that looks for seven dimensional operators, is that the cross section is very suppressed. So I told you that the coefficient in front of a seven dimensional operator has to have mass dimension minus three to make the whole term uh, uh, mass dimension four, which is the dimension of the Lagrangian. So because the Coefficient is mass dimension minus three, and the cross section of this kind of scattering it goes as the square of the Lagrangian. Your cross section will be proportional to one over lambda to the sixth. And if lambda is big, uh, because you expect the new physics to come from some higher scale, if lambda is big, then this cross section is uh, very suppressed uh, by this kind of scale. So to, there is a way we can avoid these complications, and is that if we look for some kind of middle way between these. And that's why we chose to look for flavor violation. So because Mutristan is a purely leptonic probe, it's different from the LHC, the neutrino stable beta decay, and so on, in the sense that everything can happen in the lepton sector. And that actually makes it, it turns out that this makes it very effective at seeing flavor violation in the leptons, in the charged leptons. And all the Wilson coefficients for these flavor uh, violating operators uh, are mass dimension six. So the cross-section is only suppressed by lambda to the four rather than lambda to the six. So if these lambdas are the same, then we would expect that we are more prone to see lepton flavor violation than lepton number violation at uh, mu Tristan. So there's a connection then between lepton number violation and lepton flavor violation. And if you now look at the standard model Lagrangian, there's only a single Yukawa term because the neutrinos are massless in the standard model. Because there's only one Yukawa term, you have only one mass matrix that you have to diagonalize. So yeah, you go ahead and diagonalize it, and then your your the two of these matrices appear. But what you can do then is to redefine the fields. So you redefine what you call a right left-handed electron, right-handed electron, and a neutrino. And once you've done that, you have a mass matrix that is completely diagonal, and at the same time, you have a weak interaction that is completely diagonal. So nowhere in the standard model do you violate lepton uh, flavor. It's completely 100% conserved in the standard model. But this situation becomes more complex if now the neutrinos have a mass, which they appear to do. So there are two possibilities here. Either they have a direct mass in which you would have a Yukawa term similar to the standard model, but uh, with a li very light right hand neutrino instead. If this is the case, you would simply end up with another math matrix that you can no longer diagonalize because you already redefined your fields and decided what everything should be. So you will end up with a neutrinos where the flavors do not correspond to masses. And therefore, you cannot say that the electron fla flavor has so-and-so mass because everything is mixed and you will instead have neutrino oscillation. Another possibility is that the neutrinos have Majorana masses in which case they get their mass from uh, from some uh, other kind of interaction that uh, only involves the left-handed uh, lepton uh, neutrinos, uh, or can involve right-handed too, but necessarily at the standard model level on the, the, the left-handed ones. And this kind of term then violates lepton number. And it can come from some higher dimension operator encoded by this one over lambda where there is some new physics that leads to an interaction between, let's say, two Higgses and two leptons, and that gives the, the neutrinos a mass. 
So because there is some new physics there, there is some kind of new interaction. And because you're at the standard model invariant level, in order to interact with the neutrinos, you have to interact with the lepton doublet. And there sits the charged leptons as well. So if you introduce this kind of new interaction to give the neutrinos some mass, you will give the charged leptons some kind of new stuff to do also. And there's there's no there's no uh, a priori reason to assume that this these new interactions uh, are diagonal in flavor in this exactly same way that the Yukawa coupling was diagonal. So just because you diagonalized the Yukawa coupling, it would be very weird if you also diagonalized accidentally this kind of new interaction, or maybe not weird, but it, it, uh, it, there's no reason to assume that this is the case at least. So if the neutrinos are Majorana, we might expect flavor violating interactions also in the charged leptons. And this is called charged lepton flavor violation. So actually when I say today lepton violation, I often mean just charged lepton flavor violation. Uh, so lepton flavor violation in the charged leptons. Uh, so based on this, if there is some kind of new physics that give the neutrinos a Majorana mass, we might expect that the first signs of it at neutristen come from a lepton flavor violation rather than a lepton number violation. And that's the reason that today uh, we are talking about charged lepton flavor violation at neutristen. So the way to connect this directly to lepton number violating operators uh, is some ongoing work. But today I will talk about lepton flavor. So we we, can, we then ask ourselves instead, can muon colliders or specifically mutristen be used to probe charged lepton flavor violating interactions? And uh, we have to then compare the possible modes at mutristen with the existing limits coming from these uh, rare leptonic decays. So the case of muon into electron gamma, the decay of muon into three electrons, and also a bunch of uh, similar tau decays. So we ask ourselves then, can we see it at Mutristan? And how does then Mutristan compare to these existing kind of limits? Okay, so the other limits, I told you, they were these rare decays. Uh, there are also some other ones. So for example, you can have a muonic atom. So a, an atom where one of the electrons has been changed for a muon. And there is a chance that this muon spontaneously converts to an electron. Uh, so that's muon to electron conversion. And uh, there's also the muonium to antimuonium. So I told you already, muonium is the bound state of a muon and an electron. And you can look for the spontaneous conversion of this one into uh, the, I mean, mu plus e, e, mu minus e plus bound state into a mu plus e minus bound state or the other way around. Uh, so this file is a lot of flavor too. Then the more kind of uh, common modes are the mu to e gamma decay and uh, mu to three e decay. And today I will be mostly talking about the mu to three e. The reason is that this is a four Fermi operator, which is the same kind of operator that you would have at, in a two to two scattering at mu Tristan. So we can then directly compare exactly the same operator from mu Tristan and the rarity case. But I will also mention, I'll also come back a bit to the, especially the mu to e gamma, but also uh, show limits from uh, muonium to antimuonium case. Okay. So at mu Tristan, then the Lagrangian we use is this. So it's the same one as before, these six dimensional operators, which uh, can be flavor violating uh, depending on the values of these indices, i, j, k, l, which determine the flavor of these leptons. So looking at specifically one flavor uh, setup. So if we look now at the tau mu 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 flavor content, that, that operator we get, and we lead to two processes. It will lead to mu mu to mu to tau at mu tristan, but it will also lead to tau to three mu uh, decay uh, from from the very same operator. You would get both of these uh, processes, and they depend uh, differently on the values of a and b. So uh, the on these projection operators up here. So they depend differently on whether it's a left-handed or right-handed uh, curve. So at Mu Tristan, the cross section uh, mu mu to mu tau is uh, given like this with a dependence uh, one over six on the LR terms, while the branching ratio tau to three mu depends with a factor one over two. So, in order to directly compare the two modes, let's define this ratio. So, this whole stuff over this whole stuff, we, we will call uh, psi. And the finding psi like this will let us then write the number of events as mu at mutristem as some number times psi 
times the uh, root of S uh, squared, where S is the center of mass energy, or root S is the center of mass energy, times the luminosity times the branching ratio of tau to 3 mu. And the experimental limit on this branching ratio of tau to 3 mu, which actually comes from Bell, which is uh, right here outside my window, uh, as being constrained to be less than uh, 10 to the minus 8. So we can then put, plug that into our expression. So if if this branching ratio is at its experimental limit, so the actual branching ratio would be very close. They just missed seeing it at Bell. And we have a luminosity of one inverse atobarn and a center of mass energy of two TV. Uh, the number of events we expect on your Tristan is uh, almost eight times 10 to the three in case this psi is equal to one. So that's quite a lot of events. And uh, this psi, if you imagine, for example, a model that only induces uh, this uh, left-handed uh, uh, coefficient, this ratio would actually be one, and then you would expect 8,000 elements. And it, it, uh, it's linearly dependent on this branching ratio of tau to three mu. So if they increase the sensitivity, if they don't find it uh, for one order magnitude less, then you would expect, or you can say, eight times 10 to the two events. Uh, yes. So, but the now we looked at tau to three or mu to three, no, tau to three mu, yes. That's not the most sensitive probe uh, coming from this uh, left flavor violating for forming the case. So the mu to three E is a lot more sensitive. So the, the previous branching ratio limit I told you was 10 to the minus eight. For mu to three E, the limit is instead 10 to the minus 12. So it's a lot more stringent. And to compare it directly, we would instead express this psi with different flavor indices now upstairs and downstairs. So from the mu Tristan mode, we have still tau to three, tau to mu mu mu. For the uh, mu to three e mode, we would have to write our coefficients with mu to three e. So this psi is no longer just a ratio for the same operator, but there are different different operators like this because the flavor content is different. So if we plug this stuff in, or if we plug the mu to three e branching ratio in instead, we would actually expect 0 0.67 events of mu Tristan if psi is close to one. And these are very few events, so we would not be able to see it. However, I should say that the fact that psi is one is in this case, where we have different flavor content is by no, by no means uh, reasonable if we think that this flavor violation is connected to leptonormal violation. Uh, if we do think that this operator is somehow responsible for the neutrino mass also, or related to it, we would expect this coefficient psi mu to 3e to actually be proportional to the difference between the uh, two mass splittings. So the 1 to 3 and 1 to 2 mass splittings in, in the neutrino mass matrix. And that's a factor of roughly 30. And this is taking all the angles to their central values and the no CP violation. So if we include also CP violation and this picture will change a lot. So we cannot say from this fact that we do not, we shall not see events of neutrism. Uh, it simply means that this mode constrains it uh, quite a lot more severely for small values of Xi. So we can do this also with the other observables. Like I said, mu to 3e is by far the most, most sensitive, as you can see here by the different branching ratios. Uh, but there are also other observables, tau to 3e, tau to 3 mu, tau to mu mu e, and so on. And from an agnostic point of view, where you say that you don't really understand uh, what flavor comes from in the standard model and why these things should be similar, you, sh you should then treat them as separate uh, limits. And so that's what's done here. And you see the number of events expected at mu Tristan here. So the 10 to the 3, 10 to the 4 for these tau modes, but uh, 6 times 10 to the minus 2 for the mu to the e. And in the future, all these modes will get uh, uh, a lot more stringent limits. So by several orders of magnitudes, this will change. And uh, especially the mu to 3 e is expected to have a limit of 10 to the minus 16 meaning seven times 10 to the minus six events of neutristan. So then perhaps it becomes less likely to, to see it. But for two reasons, it would still be very interesting to see the results from neutristan. And one thing, or, or yeah, 
one thing is to test this idea, right? Um, so perhaps we are wrong in assuming uh, that this relation holds. So if we don't see the muted three E but see something at muted mutrist, then that would really tell us a lot about uh, what's going on. Or it would tell us that we were wrong in assuming this uh, kind of uh, relation. Also, uh, if they do see something at muted three E, then that highly motivates building mutrist because we can probe it in a different way. And there are more modes to look for, like um, the more flavor contents we can see in the final state at Mutristan than given only by this Muta 3 e mode. So that would highly motivate building Mutristan. OK, so now I will uh, connect this kind of EFT results to a concrete model that does relate the leptin flavor violation and leptin number violation to more concretely see uh what is the connection and uh, what does that imply for the uh, the lmb scale so the scale of electron number violation that we can probe and what does it imply for the neutrino observables so the mass splittings the angle cp violation so so the model that we will talk about or that we consider now is the type 2 CISA model where in its interaction with the leptons uh, given by this term here, it interacts with only with the lepton doublet. So the, you introduce uh, one new particle, and that's the delta here, which is a SU2L triplet. And it interacts with the two standard model lepton doublets. Uh, so it has one neutral component and one doubly charged component and two single charged components. And if now the neutral component gets a web, this term would give a uh, mass to the uh, uh, neutrinos. And you can see that here. So the in in the term with the neutrinos, if you now plug in the web, you can express this uh, as the mass of the neutrino like this, where the, the mass can then be diagonalized with the this matrix U, which is the PMNS matrix. And this matrix, the uh, determines how the neutrinos oscillate, basically, because you chose to diagonalize uh, the charged leptons and the weak interaction, then you're, you're going to have neutrino oscillations determined by this U matrix, where we have also two C, uh, three CP violating phases. So there's the what's called the direct CP violating phase, uh, delta CP, and then there are the two Majorana CP violating phases. So at at neutrino oscillation experiments, they can uh, constrain this delta CP, although not as good as they can constrain the other parameters, but still they can see it. But they, they are totally, uh, this these Majorana angles are totally invisible to neutrino oscillation experiments. And I should also say that uh, in the type 2 CSR, the neutrino mass is completely independent of the delta mass, as you can see by this relation. So it only depends on the coupling, HIJ, and the web. So unlike the famous type 1 seesaw, where it's a seesaw in the sense that when you make the right neutrino heavy, you make the left neutrino light. This is not a seesaw in that way. It, it, the, the type 2 seesaw model doesn't care what is the delta mass. So it's not really a seesaw, but it's still con called a seesaw for IS for historical reasons. Right. So. Now, how do these lepton flavor violating decays constrain the type 2 CISA model? Uh, so that you can see in this table. So here are all the different decays, including the mu to e gamma decay and tau to e gamma and so on, and also the muonium to antimuonium conversion. They all put constraints on different couplings of this H or like different flavor contents of this coupling. And I think the most or the most stringent modes are the muon observables. So uh, mu to e gamma and uh, mu to 3 e. So by far, those are the most stringent constraints, but the other modes uh, also do put constraints and then also on the tau sector. And uh, what's more is that if you look closely on this third column, you will not see uh, a h tau tau. So from all of these decays, the there is no observable which involves two tau leptons. Therefore, you will never have a handle on the H tau tau. While at mu Tristan or yeah, at mu Tristan, you could see it in the mode mu mu to tau tau, 
would have would be proportional to h tau tau. So already then there's a interesting uh, uh, constraint that you can make. Okay, uh, so at mu Tristan, yes, at mu Tristan, uh, this type of CSA model can lead to both lepton number violation and lepton flavor violation. Yeah. So lepton number violation or yeah, lepton flavor violation first go can be seen in this mode. So new mu to uh, S channel uh, delta plus plus into back to two leptons where the leptons then no, don't necessarily have to have the same flavor content as the initial state. And this cross section depend is proportional to the H mu mu and uh, whatever coupling uh, couples to these two leptons. And then the lepton number violating mode, you can have a WW final state instead. But this cross section, rather than being proportional to the coupling H, it's proportional to the mass matrix because you have, this is essentially the, the mass mechanism. You have a insertion of the delta VEV here. And as I mentioned then before, we do expect this mode to be small. But there's no reason to assume that this mode is small just because the neutrinos are very light. Neutrinos could be light in the type 2C star because the couplings are small, but it could also be light because the web is small. And if the latter part is the case, you would still have this kind of process, but this process would be heavily suppressed. So in that way, it can be, if you want to look for lepton number validating processes, it might be beneficial to instead look for these kind of processes, which avoid the small web, uh, if that is the reason the neutrinos are not. So uh, to compare the type 2C is to our analysis from before, we then take the EFT limit. Uh, so I said it didn't matter for the neutrino mass uh, what the mass of delta is, but it does matter in colliders because the heavier the delta, the harder it is to produce it. Uh, and in taking this EFT limit, we then assume that the delta is very massive. If it was light, if it was light enough to be produced on shell at Mutristan, that would be a completely different story. And we would we could search for resonant production and that would be a lot easier. But if it's very heavy, we would have these effective uh, operators. So in the kind of Lagrangian we had before, the only non-zero Wilson coefficient would be the LL part because the delta only talks to the left and the leptons. And this psi parameter, what we had before, we can now directly express it in terms of the neutrino mass matrices or the neutrino mass matrix uh, like this. So this ratio, uh, rather than being some mysterious ratio of Wilson coefficients, it's now depends on the oscillation parameters. So all the angles and mass splittings of the neutrino mass matrix. And in order to be able to compare things in a nice way, we define a scale lambda as the value of the, or one over lambda squared as the value of the Wilson coefficient with only tau indices in the special case where the lightest neutrino is massless, there's no CP violation and all the oscillation angles are at their central value coming from neutrino oscillation ex experiments. So we, we, we parameterize, parameterize lambda in this way in order to easily compare what is the effect of changing all these parameters later. And then we can express that as mass matrix squared over the mass of delta, uh, web of delta, both squared, where I now put a bar on this math matrix, mass matrix to signify the fact that we're using the central values of all the parameters. And in this kind of parameterization, we can express now the number of events for mu mu to mu tau at mu tristan as uh, being proportional to uh, lambda over 34 TV to the minus four uh, for a luminosity of one octobarn inverse and a central mass energy of two TV squared. Uh, and this ratio of the neutrino masses over the uh, masses with a bar. So in this term is all where all the uh, dependence on the oscillation angles appear times 100. And what this means is that if this scale of new physics is at 34 TV, if the scale is at 34 TV, we would expect 100 events to Tristan, which is kind of what we assume to be the limit of where plausibly they could observe something. And we can then compare it to the lepton flavor violating the case. And what we find then is actually that this scale is higher. So for the mu to E gamma and the mu to 3E, both, uh, both of these observables, the scale will be 45 TV. So this depends uh, 
first of all, it depends highly non trivially on especially the M1, the mass of the lightest neutrino, and delta, the CP violate, direct CP violating angle. And uh, if we change these values, this story would change quite a lot. But still, if we assume uh, for simplicity that they have these values up here, we would still see that the mu to 3e gamma and mu to 3e are actually more sensitive probes. Uh, however, there is one thing which we have not looked at yet, and that is elastic scattering at neutristin. So the type 2 seesaw model can actually also give rise to the mu mu to mu mu scattering. Now, this might look boring because it is part of the standard model, but it turns out that it's actually a lot easier to constrain this kind of mode because of the uh, different dependence uh, on uh, lambda. So because there is a standard model background in the T-channel photon exchange, the total matrix element will be the sum of the standard model and the, the beyond standard model modes. And that means that there is actually a term in the cross-section, which will be proportional to lambda to the minus two rather than lambda to the minus four, which would be the case for purely beyond standard model cross-section. And back to the table that I showed you quite early on in the beginning, we saw then that the type, this Wilson coefficients would be probably at 100 TeV uh, for elastic scattering. And that's higher than the 34 TeV, which we had on the previous slide. So if we now consider this mode also, together with all the lepton flavor violating the case, we get this kind of plot uh, for delta CB equal to zero, where you have lambda on the y-axis and M1, the mass of the lightest uh, neutrino mass eigenstate on the x-axis. And what you see here are the different kind of probes. So uh, green is mu to 3e, red is mu to e gamma decay, and they're quite high up here. Black is the mu mu to mu tau at mu tristan for 2 TeV center of mass energy. So that's, as we saw before, that's uh, less constraining than the, those rare modes. However, if we now look at the dotted line, uh, 100 events at the 10 TeV mu tristan, that's all the way up here. And uh, 10 TeV is uh, not, not completely unrealistic. Uh, it's what they could do in their current, uh, what's already there kind of 2 TV, but 10 TV is by far not uh, unrealistic. And that's all the way up here. And if they build that uh, uh, experiment, then you would probably be able to see the lepton flavor by little moves. The elastic scattering, which I said, uh, for a 2 TV immutristan is all the way up here. So that's even better than the 10 TV lepton flavor by little moves. So what we can conclude from this is that uh, Probably what's easiest to look for at Tristan is uh, the elastic scattering. So then we have actually gone all the way from, we want to see lepton number violation. What you should then look for is mu mu to mu mu uh, scattering at Tristan. So that might sound weird, but I hope that I've convinced you that this is a good idea. Uh, there's a, I told you that there's a dependence on the direct angle, CP violating angle. So as you can see here, the number of events change significantly for different values of this angle. So in this plot, we've assumed that mu to 3e is at its incremental limit like before. So if this branching ratio is 10 to the minus 12 and the delta CP is pi over three, you would expect 100 events at the mu tristan with uh, two TV center mass energy. So the main point of this plot is to see how much the dependence on the delta CP is. Uh, so we can also consider, because mu Tristan could look also for the tau tau final states, um, we could look at the ratio mu mu to mu tau over mu mu to tau tau. How does this uh, change with the different values of M1 and delta CP? So in this plot, you see now that the dependence on delta CP is actually more or less disappeared. There's not much uh, happening here, but with M1, there's still a very large dependence. The reason for this is that this mu mu to mu tau has a one diagonal component and one off diagonal component of the neutrino mass matrix, while a mu mu to tau tau has two diagonal components. And M1 sits in the diagonal. So this gives you a completely different dependence on the M1, and then you get a nice plot like this. So what this tells us is that if if we do find a type 2 CSA model, mu tristan can be used to look for nice observables like this, like ratios, uh, to really nail down on what is M1. Um, and also delta CP, but for other ratios. Also, I told you that it's not possible for the oscillation experiments to see the Majorana CP relating angles, but this kind of ratio would also be affected by those at Nutristin. 
So here are four plots for different values of M1 and uh, Dirac delta CP. And on the X and Y axis are the two Majorana angles. And you see that they can change this ratio, mu mu to mu tau over mu mu to tau tau, can change by a factor of five or so, depending on what these angles are. So this gives us a handle also to observe these angles, which is not possible otherwise. And uh, yes, I think lastly, I will show them the remaining angles. So the theta angles, uh, which do not affect significantly this ratio. What that uh, should tell you is that the, the experimental uncertainty in these are not going to change dramatically the conclusions that I drew earlier, because the, our analysis from earlier was using the central values of these. So the central values are here in the middle in these plots. In the dotted line is the one sigma uh, region where they should be. So they by one sigma, they should be inside the dotted lines. By three sigma, they should be inside the dashed lines. And by five sigma, they should be inside the whole plot uh, for different values of M1, as you can see on the x-axis. Right, so I think that was it. So to summarize, we've seen that same sign muon colliders such as mutristan can be used to probe uh, lepton flavor violating interactions. And it might be easier to look for lepton flavor violation than for lepton number violation. Or I should have added here, it might be even easier to look for lepton flavor conservation in the mu mu to mu mu. And signs of new physics leading to this. Uh, yes, that, so that's what, okay, I did right. <laughs> so we could perhaps first see it in flavor conserving scatterings. And uh, if the lepton flavor violating operators are connected to the neutrino mass mechanism, we can use muon colliders to constrain all the different mixing parameters. So thank you very much for listening. Yeah, thanks very much, Kari, for a very interesting talk and for staying within the time. <laughs> very good. So, so we have time for questions. We have plenty of time for questions. Uh, and maybe, so while you start, while you think about questions, let, let me start. Um, so you talked about tau, tau plus, and mu plus in the final state. How about electrons or, I mean, positrons? Yes, so I, there wasn't enough. Uh, uh, I, I didn't include it in this talk, but yes, we, we consider also uh, electrons in the final state. So all these, these ratios, we show these ratios for, in the paper, we show it also for mu mu to uh, mu, no, mu mu to e tau and mu mu to over mu mu to tau tau. So definitely it's possible. So this here, the dependence is quite different, especially the, uh, if I remember correctly, the direct uh, uh, CP violating angle dependence is different. So yes, uh -huh. that's definitely possible. So um, do, do you learn something new or how many channels would you have to measure to, to pin it down? Uh, well, how, how, many many how many can you have? You have, uh, You're you're always having mu mu in the initial state, mm -hmm. uh, but then there are nine entries in the neutrino mass matrix. But if you take if you remove because it's symmetric, so if you remove three of them, you would have six different observables. Yeah. So that would give you. I I mean, uh, if you have the collider, you would measure all of them, right? If you see something, so that would uh, hopefully let you pin uh, pin pin the things down quite well. Mm -hmm. Okay, good. Thanks. Thanks. So, are, are there questions? Yeah, um, I have a question. So, I'm not sure I understood your statement that type 2 seesaw is not a seesaw. So, mm -hmm. I thought well, the depth of the triplet, I mean, it should shrink when the triplet is heavier. Isn't that right? Um, wait, where is that? Yeah, so why should it shrink if the triplet is heavier? I think the the VEF actually, ah, okay, yes. So, yeah, if it's if it's this kind of diagram here, mm -hmm. you mean, yeah, yes, then uh, uh two, okay, yes, because then you have it as a propagator between it and two Higgs. Yeah. Insertion. Yeah. So yes, th then it would be a C surface according to the diagram I drew. If if that's where the wave of the delta comes from, so to say. Yeah. Yeah. So can I make a comment? I mean, there's another way of thinking about it. So the the triplet gets an induced wave, 
So there's a cubic term that couples the, the triplet uh, scalar to the to two Higgs doublets. Um, and when the two Higgs doublets, when the Higgs doublet gets a VEB, that induces a linear term for the triplet. And when you have a linear term, you automatically get a VEV. Uh, but it's a, but if you if you make the the mass squared of the triplet positive, right? So then then the VEV is very small because in the absence of that that cubic term, the VEV would be zero. Um, so it it is genuinely a seesaw mechanism, but it's in the VEV. I see. So you would write the relation V delta equal V squared over M delta, essentially. Yeah. 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 No, okay, yes. The, then it's a seesaw. I agree. Yeah. <clears throat> So I actually have a question. Um, we started no. to talk about this before before you you started to speak. But what do you know about the next steps in terms of realizing um, uh, a project such as such as Mutristan? What sort of what sort of discussions are taking place? How seriously is it being pursued? So um, I think um, I haven't heard this from direct sources, but I've heard. From secondary sources that we're we're being uh, more motivated to study this kind of approach rather than the ILC uh, kind of option, so I think that should say uh, something. But more more concretely about any plans to to build it or to start uh, financing it, I don't have any information currently, unfortunately. Okay. Um. So, so for mu Tristan, there is also the other channel, right? With mu plus e minus. Yes. Um, in principle, you could also use that to test these kind of models, or to test those operators. Yes. Um, did Did you look at anything, or there there is some, or, or can you comment on it? So, uh, we didn't look at it in uh, in this work. Um, one reason is that. You would have a uh, you would have a smaller uh, center of mass energy mm -hmm. because you cannot accelerate the electrons as hard as you can accelerate the the muons. Uh, but yes, essentially the whole this whole kind of analysis could also be done for for that, and that would change the of course change the flavor content, so it would lead to more observables, so to say. Mm -hmm. But uh, we didn't look at at that yet. Yeah, yeah, that's good. Thanks. Um, and I have another question, uh, if I may. Uh, there, there's in the beginning you talked about your other paper or that upcoming mm -hmm. paper, yeah. and you uh, had that comparison plot with the yes. uh, neutrino dust, double beta decay, and so on, and all of those. Yeah, exactly, colorful plot. Um, so, but what what assumptions go in there uh, on that? Okay, can you comment on those or kind of in, in those plots? So, the... What, so the assumptions that go in are for it's essentially the assumption that we have some new physics at a at a very high scale that generates mm -hmm. these operators, um, but there is no assumption on the uh, there is not really more assumption than that, so to say. So the we come we treat the flavor aspect as completely agnostic. So. Mm -hmm. The, the different flavors are considered here different probes, even off diagonal flavor components like EE is different from EMU uh, and so on. Okay, okay. Uh, so you basically don't assume that it explains neutrino masses and leptonic mixing and so on. So basically, just keep it all as independent parameters here in that figure. Well, what? Yes, exactly. So if, if, we, if we would include neutrino masses, uh, also the, this picture would change. A lot, but how to connect the operators to neutrino masses is quite non-trivial, also. So mm -hmm. what many people do is to say that the neutrino mass is proportional to, or rather, it's equal to the Wilson coefficient times uh, the number of waves you need to balance out the the mass dimension, or where it actually it comes from somewhere else. But that's essentially what the relation looks like, at least, and. Uh, that that depending on the underlying UV completion, this story will change quite drastically. So we do we do not consider the neutrino masses to be hard probes of mm -hmm. of, of these operators, so to say. So we consider only the the these other probes. Mm -hmm. Okay, good. Thanks. Yeah. 
Um, one more question. So yep. one slide you had um, a, a re um, relation for psi in terms of the mass splittings of the neutrinos. Yes. So it's, I mean, that's quite a nice yes. thing. So it's an easy way to see why. And I think it was an, on another slide actually where you introduced that. Um, oh, okay. Um, yes. Here. Yeah. I mean that, yeah, yeah, on the bottom there. Ah, you mean in the bottom here? Is there yes, an easy yes. way to see it? Yeah, because I mean, that's is quite... Is there an easy way to see it? I think what we did here is to assume the type 2 Cs are actually. So we assume for simplicity that you only have one of these. So if you have only the LL, LL, and if you then... So in that case, this above relation simplifies to this relation here, like the xi is equal to this ratio with the neutrino masses, uh, mm -hmm. if you only have one of those operators active. And in that case, I, if you plug in the expression for the neutrino mass, and uh, you will, all the waves of delta will cancel out, and you will get uh, only, I mean, this is essentially depending on the h, right? And mm -hmm. all the, the neutrino angles come in. I mean, that's where the dependence on those lie. So you know how the you know how you or you parameterize the PMNS matrix in a certain way, and you know where it comes from. It comes from the neutrino mass mechanism, and that you know that that's given by the H's. So you, you can parameterize the H in the same way, and in that way you get that this ratio. I mean, if you if you just plug in the what it is, then you will get this. Uh, dependence on all the angles and so on. And I think in order to get to that relation, we made some assumptions, simplifying assumptions saying that the theta one, two angle is 45 degrees and the theta one, three angle was zero and so on. I mean, these approximations that we get and then you get this kind of uh, relation. Okay, thanks. Okay. No. That's interesting. Um, any other questions? Uh, if not, then I would like to thank Kara again for 